So, uh, today we will start with a small demo. So, we will just have, uh, so the swelling itself will take some time, but we will just have a, the experiment start while I start talking about uh, uh, smart hydrogels. So, these are hydrogels, these are different kinds of hydrogels which we have prepared in our lab. So, the one which is here that is isabgol, uh, one is uh, kanjaglucamanon, this is just PVA and this is uh, polyhema. So, these are the hydrogels which we have prepared and you can just have a look. Um, so, uh, isabgol is uh, a polysaccharide, so it is primarily arabinoxylan. So, what we do is uh, we buy uh, what is called isabgol commercially and we just dissolve it in water to prepare this hydrogel. Uh, KGM is conjaglucamanon which is again a polysaccharide uh, and uh, PVA and polyhema are uh, synthetic hydrogels, synth synthetic polymers which are used for hydrogels. So, we have prepared all of these, some of these are uh, will swell a lot, some might not swell uh, as much. So, we have only a couple of beakers, but we do have uh, a 6 well plate. So, what we will do is we will cut a small piece of it and put it inside these swell, uh, 6 well plates and we will pour. Uh, the buffer. So, she has given me PBS. So, we will pour a little bit of this buffer and we will see how the uh, final state of it is. That will show us how the swelling has actually taken out and what we can do is after, after it swells we will take it out and blot it with the tissue paper and then we can see whether the water actually comes out or not. So, the loosely adhered water can only come out if it is properly swollen and the water is closely interacting it cannot actually come out. So, we will try and do this. So, what we will first do is I will ask for volunteers who can cut it up into smaller pieces and we will put it in this and we will wait for how it swells. Okay. So, after we put up a small piece you can actually feel the texture as well the dry ones. So, that when we after swelling you will be able to see how it feels. So, that is PVA. So, it is quite strong actually. So, uh, one is PVA and uh, I already have polyhema. These are simple too. So, these are uh, natural polysaccharides. So, as you can see, it is so much easier to cut. They are such, they are weak, mechanically weak compared to what you had with uh, PVA. I do not cut too much of that, that will swell a lot. So, uh, you can show it around to people or the, so that people can take it up and have a look. So, I am not measuring any volume or anything uh, volume of the buffer because that does not really matter. We just have to add enough so that it can absorb. So, this PBS. So, let us see how well it swells and just leave it here. Today, we will talk about a special class of hydrogels which are called as the intelligent or smart hydrogels. So, these hydrogels are basically stimuli responsive hydrogels. See, when hydrogels swell, they just swell when you put it in PBS, right. So, that is what is happening to these. These, when you put it there, they are going to absorb a lot of water and start swelling. Whereas, um, if you are talking about the stimuli responsive hydrogels, they respond to external stimuli. The stimuli could be pH, temperature, electrical field, light, magnetic field and so on. Uh, in response to these stimuli, they will either shrink or swell or bend or degrade and this can be used to uh, tailor its applications in tissue engineering. So, this is basically prepared using uh, stimuli responsive monomers or pendant groups which are the side chains which would respond to certain stimuli. Right? So, an unswollen hydrogel in the presence of certain uh, stimuli can actually form uh, the swollen hydrogels. Right? So, it would 
uh, this is the most common thing which we look at like swelling there is also a response uh, with respect to gelation and so on so in some cases the gelation itself uh, is dependent on how well the uh, it responds to stimuli okay so uh, these are some of the common environmental stimuli and the type of hydrogel which is uh, which can respond to these kinds of uh, stimuli and the mechanism and its applications. So, when you have a hydrogel which can respond to uh, electrical stimuli, it would usually be a poly electrolyte hydrogel. So, when you have a poly electrolyte hydrogel, there are uh, ions which can actually respond to the ele external electrical stimuli. Right. So, uh, when you have a change in charge uh, distribution, it can cause uh, swelling or drug release or biomolecule release in case of tissue engineering. So, this is used in case of actuators. Um, or for uh, engineering artificial muscles and also as on off uh, drug delivery uh, vehicles. So, with respect to thermal things they are called as thermoresponsive hydrogels. So, these thermoresponsive hydrogels uh, actually uh, respond to particular temperature even gelation can actually be dependent on uh, temperature and uh, the change in polymer polymer and polymer water interactions uh, happens with at specific temperatures and this causes either swelling or shrinkage which will lead to drug release or biomolecule release. So, uh, this again is used for on off drug release and also for uh, squeezing devices in the sense that uh, when the temperature changes instead of swelling it just shrinks. So, it will just squeeze out whatever uh, is present inside. So, that's kind of that kind of a mechanism has been used. So, one of the common uh, thermoresponsive hydrogels which we will talk about is uh, uh, poly n isopropyl acrylamide uh, it is also called as uh, p nipam right so it is a acronym is that but uh, this is very well studied because of uh, its the temperature at which it uh, goes through these changes so we'll go to go into details of that in the next few slides so ph uh, plays a crucial role in your body your ph is not the same right so your ph can actually be different based on uh, which part of the body you are talking about and which uh, state of homeostasis your body is in. So, under normal condition your physiological pH is 7.4 like around 7.4, but uh, does not mean that your uh, uh, your pH is always 7.4. In case of injury or something your pH will actually go down significantly and in certain regions in your body like your stomach your pH is actually significantly lower. So, using this uh, difference just leave it here. So, using this difference uh, to actually uh, deliver molecules or uh, cause gelation has been extensively studied. So, uh, so, acidic and basic hydrogels are the most common examples polyacrylamide and uh, PDEAM are all molecules which have been shown to have pH responsive properties. So, ionization of the polymer chain. Sir, are these smart hydrogels made from special uh, polymers or can regular hydrogels be modified to have smart properties? They have to have some monomer or a side chain which will respond to these stimuli right. So, if you were to take just PVA, a regular PVA hydrogel cannot behave like that. So, if you can create side chains which can uh, provide stimuli responses then you can do it. So, which would mean you are modifying PVA into some other uh, polymer before you do it. Uh, for a hydrogel a surface modification would not be very helpful because hydrogel is a 3D structure right. So, uh, surface modifications are usually done for um, polymers which are being implanted uh, whereas in case of polymers which are going to be fabricated into something else then you need a chemical modification of the entire thing a surface modification alone cannot actually address the uh, required needs. So, uh, what happens in a pH responsive hydrogel is the ionization of the polymer chain occurs due to pH change and uh, this leads to swelling and further release of the molecule which you have loaded. So, this is primarily used in pH dependent uh, drug delivery systems. So, magnetic fields have also been uh, explored as external stimuli. So, uh, magnetic particles which are dispersed in a hydrogel matrix can uh, cause this kind of a magnetic response. And the advantage of doing this would be by applying uh, magnetic stresses, you might be able to alter the pores in the gel or uh, cause swelling which will lead to the drug release. 
So, this can uh, be used as an on off uh, drug delivery system right. So, on demand you can provide a magnetic field to release the drug molecule and uh, otherwise it will not be uh, delivered. So, this kind of a uh, thing has been extensively studied for cancer therapy and so on. So, ionic strength has also been used you use an ionic hydrogel. So, depending on the ionic strength you will be able to control the release. And uh, this is primarily used as biosensors for glucose and uh, people have tried to use this to identify uh, glucose, uh, sense glucose and then supply insulin and so on. So, chemical stimuli uh, is basically in the presence of other uh, electron accepting groups. So, there could be other chemical molecules which can trigger the swelling or uh, change in uh, the physical properties leading to release of the molecules loaded. Enzyme responsive or bioresponsive hydrogels are the ones where uh, there is an enzyme substrate correlation. So, you would have hydrogels which are immobilized with enzymes and uh, the production of this enzymatic conversion will lead to swelling or uh, release of the molecule. So, it could also uh, be the other way where the enzyme acts on it for degradation to have it released. So, it could you could your hydrogel could be a substrate for the enzyme as well. So, uh, light again is used for delivery. So, using optical uh, or other waves, light waves like UV radiation, see whether that can alter the uh, cross linking of the hydrogels, thereby you can change how it is, how the gelation happens, and how the uh, release happens, and so on. Thermo responsive hydrogels are the ones which have been extensively studied. Many polymers exhibit uh, thermo responsive uh, phase transition property. So, these hydrogel, these polymers actually have something called UCST or LCST. UCST is the upper critical solution temperature and uh, LCST is the lower critical solution temperature. So, when a polymer exhibits, exhibits uh, UCST, what happens is uh, it shrinks when you cool it below UCST and it, uh, it, uh, it, it is present as chains when it is above UCST and the other way around happens when a polymer has LCST. So, uh, poly and isopropyl uh, acrylamide or uh, p nipam is one of the most commonly studied thermoresponsive polymers because it actually has uh, a thermally reversible property with an LCST at 32 degree Celsius in pure water. So, this 32 degree Celsius is very close to your physiological temperature of 37. So, that makes it an ideal candidate to work with. So, at room temperature you are talking about 25 degree Celsius and at physiological temperature you are talking about 37 and this actually comes in between these two temperatures. So, this gives us a, a nice property which can actually help in using this thermoresponsive behavior in uh, physiological conditions. So, above the LCST what happens is a reversible phase transition occurs and the expanded coil which is seen in the hydrophilic environment which is seen here. So, what you see here the expanded coils that you see here uh, when you increase the temperature above the LCST it goes into uh, a compact globule formation which causes the shrinkage of the hydrogel. So, whatever molecule is actually loaded inside will get released thereby the squeezing kind of an effect is there for the molecule to be released immediately. So, this is a thermoresponsive uh, hydrogel which has been extensively studied in many different applications. So, uh, pH responsive hydrogels display big differences in properties based on the pH itself. They are made from monomers which have ionic groups or using cross linking with poly electrolytes. Uh, so, uh, even with PVA you can actually prepare it to be a poly electrolyte. Right. So, depending on how you do the cross linking you can create a poly electrolyte nature for the hydrogel and that can help in PV, pH responsive behavior. So, uh, at appropriate pH and ionic strength the side chains actually ionize to develop fixed charges and uh, this can cause either repulsive forces or attractive forces depending on uh, depending on whether it is attractive or repulsive forces the, there will be swelling or deswelling of the hydrogen. Uh, even small changes uh, to the pH can actually have significant effects on the mesh size. So, one when the porosity changes obviously your diff uh, diffusion properties are going to change and that will mean your release will also change. Some of the common uh, hydrogels which are used are poly polyacrylamide, uh, polyacrylic acid. Uh, polymeth uh, polymethacrylic acid and so on. So, these have actually shown to have pH responsive uh, behaviors. So, this is what happens. 
So, when you have an anionic, so you can either have an anionic hydrogel or a cationic hydrogel. So, you can start with any ionic hydrogel. So, an anionic hydrogel below its uh, pKa uh, basically stays in an unswollen uh, form and above its pKa it starts swelling and uh, it starts releasing whatever molecule would be present at a much faster rate. So, even in an unswollen state there will be some leakage of the material if it is only diffusion, it'll, but it will be a much slower diffusion because the mesh sizes are very small. So, in case of a cationic uh, hydrogel you will have the reverse where below pKa you will have uh, the ions being absorbed and therefore, the uh, it drug being released the hydrogel being swollen and the drug being released. So, photo or light responsive hydrogels are stimulated by light to induce uh, changes in their physical and chemical properties. So, this is prepared by functionalization of uh, polymer backbone with photoresponsive groups. So, any polymer chain which has functional groups you can add these photoresponsive groups which will respond to different kinds of uh, different wavelengths of light. The optical signal is first captured by the photochromic molecules which are these side chains and this converts uh, this photo radiation to a chemical signal. Uh, either through isomerization or cleavage or dimerization which leads to uh, different properties. Uh, one of the common parameters which is usually affected by uh, light is the gelation itself. So, when you actually have light source, so these photoresponsive hydrogels will form uh, gels in the presence of a light source whereas, in the absence of it, it would not form these gels, it will just be uh, in a liquid form. So, the this uh, signal which is uh, formed is transferred to the functional part of the hydrogels which then controls its properties. So, there are other hydrogels as well like electro responsive hydrogels, these change their properties in response to changes in electric stimuli. Poly electrolyte hydrogels uh, are the ones which can be used for these because they have a uh, high concentration of ionizable groups. So, PVA, acrylic acid, uh, vinyl sulfonic acid and sulfonate polystyrene are all some of the examples which have been prepared for as polyelectrolyte hydrogels. Okay. Another interesting class of hydrogels is the glucose responsive hydrogels. So, these are uh, interesting candidates because they can actually be used for uh, the insulin delivery systems. Right. So, what happens is uh, these act as artificial pancreas and they can uh, basically swell in response to the presence of glucose. So, which means they will release insulin when there is glucose and they will shrink again uh, and not release uh, insulin when there is no glucose right. So, uh, what happens is uh, you have to uh, immobilize the glucose oxidase and a catalase into a pH responsive hydrogel. Uh, so, and this is enclosed in a saturated solution of insulin. So, now insulin is loaded into this hydrogel which can sense glucose and uh, respond to pH, pH environments right. So, when glucose concentration is high the glucose will diffuse into the hydrogel and it is con converted to gluconic acid in the presence of glucose oxidase. So, this because this uh, gluconic acid is formed the pH is going to drop. This decrease in pH will cause swelling of the pH responsive hydrogel. So, insulin is released. And once the glucose concentration reduces because of the insulin which is being released, so you are obviously there is lesser glucose present, so there is no gluconic acid, so your pH is going to increase leading to the shrinkage of the hydrogel. So, thereby it does not release any more insulin. So, this is an excellent candidate which people are exploring for uh, such demand based insulin release. Uh, so, there are some publications on it, I do not think it has gone to clinical trial stage yet. So, this is how it is, so this is uh, from a, one of the recent papers. So, what they have done is loaded something called conconavalin A and uh, in a polygema hydrogel. So, when glucose is present it results in uh, swelling and that releases the mo whatever molecule will be uh, loaded to it. Okay. So, why hydrogel? Um, whatever we looked at with respect to hydrogels till now, we looked at all the basics of hydrogels, we saw why hydrogels are used and what are the different applications which are which they are used in. We have not specifically looked at tissue engineering, we just looked at multiple things where uh, hydrogels are used and multiple types of hydrogels. So, what do you think are the advantages of hydrogels? So, that is one thing. So, you it is 
you can easily engineer it. So, there is uh, enough uh, variability to it that you can engineer it for desired physical properties. Okay. Okay, similar to EZM. Okay. okay, wound bandage would be an application where you can use hydrogels. Uh, why do you think it can be used for wound bandages? Because we can put a drug in it, antibiotic or antibacterial drug yeah. in it to prevent it. That is one thing and moist is another thing. So, pro providing a moist environment is actually important for uh, wound healing and uh, also it can absorb the wound exudates. So, the wound exudates many a times can have uh, matrix metalloproteases which will actually degrade some of the matrix which is being formed. So, it is better to have these absorbed. So, uh, depending on the level of exudates uh, having um, hydrogels which can swell moderately or significantly can actually be used. Okay, so, it is similar to ECM and uh, that is one thing. Okay, you can prepare different uh, kinds of yeah, sure. So, uh, okay, so it can actually uh, be responsive to the environment. So that is one advantage of using something like this. So what I have is uh, some of these things are there. So the swelling uh, <laughs> is a, an important factor which actually helps in transport of nutrients and uh, removal of toxins. Okay. So, uh, easily modified with cell adhesion ligands, so that is the engineering part of it, you have a lot of uh, option to change it and uh, uh, non-ionic hydrogels are usually non-thrombogenic. So, this is not something we specifically talked about. So, ionic hydrogels are thrombogenic, so it can actually trigger um, blood coagulation. So, if you were to use calcium alginate, uh, it will trigger blood coagulation, but uh, if you are using something which uh, does not have ionic properties, it is non-thrombogenic which means it will not cause uh, blood clotting. So, which is a good thing for uh, blood contact applications. So, it is usually biocompatible and similar to the ECM and so on. So, you also have uh, injectable hydrogels. So, we did not talk about it in detail. Uh, so, even the uh, thermoresponsive hydrogels, if I am going to look at it from uh, an uh, from a, an application standpoint, I can have it as a liquid at room temperature at 25 degrees Celsius and if I inject it into your body, in your body it will form a hydrogen, right. So, it will just be a simple injection for me. So, delivering site delivery is actually easier. So, if I were to give an injection with a liquid, usually what will happen? It will get dispersed all over your body which is not really a good thing. Here it will form a gel and it will stay there. So, if you are talking about drug delivery to a specific site or if you are uh, looking at uh, forming a scaffold at a specific site where cells can migrate, so this is not going to get leached out, it is going to form, the, form a uh, hydrogel there. So, those are some interesting applications for uh, injectable hydrogels. What do you think would be the disadvantage? Mechanical properties. Yeah. Mechanical properties is one serious problem. You saw some of these hydrogels which are really soft, right? So, they are like a sponge. So, mechanical properties can be an issue. What else? For the injectable ones, you can't really control the scaffold uh, geometry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it will depend on the site of injection, it will just form a mold kind of thing, but yeah, you would not have proper control over it. to the site where you want to inject it. So, <laughs> it does see not all injections are just uh, over your skin, right. So, you might have injections which are uh, much, uh, which will reach much deeper in your body. So, if I want to uh, create a, an injectable hydrogel and use it for making a liver, I would inject it to the portal vein of your body. So, I would probably use a bigger gauge needle and uh, inject it to the site where I want. So, uh, injection just means uh, minimal penetration instead of cutting a person open, I can just use a an incision, small incision kind of thing. So, that is what it is, it does not always mean the small needle which we are talking about. <laughs> okay. So, the, the, the smart hydrogels which are there, they, they respond to a particular condition, but is there any cap over how much? Like an upper limit kind of thing, over this limit they will not 
Yeah, obviously there will be some effect uh, if you are going to have uh, up to a certain level they will swell beyond a point they cannot swell right. So, it will stop if you keep increasing glucose concentration it is not going to continuously keep swelling it will have to stop at some point like for example glucose as an example even if you have other things there will always be some range within which they will work and that will depend on the material itself. Can be degraded in the body? Uh, yeah, degrading, yeah, it can get degraded, but degrading is a not a very bad thing. If as long as you can control the degradation, it is not a bad thing. If it is very hydrophilic, cell addition can be a problem, yes. But uh, the people, what people do is they try to attach ligands to it and uh, use um, proteins which have the cell addition ligands along with the material and so on. Those are ways to overcome it. So, a uh, couple of things are they are actually difficult to handle and uh, sterilization can actually affect its properties. So, it is a uh, so these hydrogels are actually quite fragile right. So, if you, uh, and they need to be sterilized properly and uh, you cannot really put it in uh, 121 degree Celsius for <laughs> 45 minutes and hope it will survive. But there are ways to hydrolyze it uh, sorry uh, sterilize it. And uh, when you are sterilizing it, uh, one of the things would be UV sterilization. But UV sterilization, you might not be able to get to the pores um, <coughs> because it is a 3D structure and uh, sterilization might not be the most effective, UV sterilization might not be the most effective. There are other things like ETO sterilization where uh, a gas is pumped through this. So, there are other ways to do it, but it gets tedious and you do not know how that affects the uh, chemical and mechanical properties of the hydrogel. So, that can be a challenge with respect to hydrogels. Okay. So, when you are talking about hydrogels in tissue engineering, they are used primarily as scaffolds uh, because they mimic ECM. Cells can adhere to the matrix or they can also be suspended within the gel. So, that is why you can actually have injectable gels in which cells are suspended. So, you, for example, if I am going to uh, inject a cartilage, so I can actually have an injectable uh, hydrogel which is an in liquid and cell cells are suspended in this liquid and when I inject it this hydrogel will form uh, into a gel of upon injection of in your body when the temperature is higher than your LCST in your body. So, this will now have cells seeded to it. So, I can have it suspended within the gel as well. So, uh, which one would you prefer if I were to give you the option which do you think you would prefer and why? Okay, so suspension would probably have more uniform uh, cell distribution. Fine. So, what would be the advantage of uh, cells adhering to the matrix? Better cell proliferation. Okay. Why do you think better cell pro proliferation? Because of better uh, cell adhesion. Uh, better cell proliferation is possible, but not because of better cell adhesion, but uh, primarily because cells are uh, to when you are seeding a cell on top of it, the cells can actually get the nutrients more easily and they are also uh, nicely adhered and spread on the surface. Whereas, when you are uh, suspending it within the gel, uh, there is no guarantee that they will have the nutrients and they might not have get the morphology which they need for uh, further proliferation and migration. What would be the disadvantage of uh, seeding it on the matrix other than non-uniform? It can get corrupted. What do you mean it can get? It proliferates so much that in one place the nutrients won't be enough for it to proliferate more. Okay. Okay. So you mean overcrowded uh, in that region it because of proliferation. Okay. Uh, Usually cells do not divide that rapidly and especially in vivo the cells will not divide that rapidly when you have other factors coming in. So, but the problem usually with adhered thing is cells can actually leach out, cells can migrate out of the matrix. Okay. So, when you are placing it in vivo the cells can migrate out of the matrix whereas in suspended it is not going to leach out very easily. 
but yeah the disadvantage would be it will not get the nutrient it may not get the nutrients depending on the size of the hydrogel and how the hydrogel properties are yeah so uh, you can have hydrogels as both biodegradable and non biodegradable hydrogels so depending on uh, how these hydrogels are fabricated you can have them uh, both ways and uh, they are also used as barriers uh, where it is used for uh, preventing uh, post operative restenosis and uh, thrombosis so uh, when there is blood coagulation uh, it can this uh, these hydrogels non ionic hydrogels can actually prevent this blood coagulation and this prevents the um, platelets and coagulation factors from contacting the vascular wall the ruptured vascular wall will trigger the coagulation cascade so by using these as barriers you can prevent um, the platelets from contacting the uh, ruptured wall and these being non thrombogenic will not trigger any uh, blood coagulation cascades so that is one way it can be used is so it, is the stent itself is made of hydrogel mm -hmm. or just by adding the hydrogel with the stent no no re restenosis is not only for stent <coughs> okay. okay so even with uh, post operative uh, restenosis can happen with any other yeah, case no yeah so any surgery uh in tissue engineering it's also used for biomolecule delivery so uh, drug delivery is one aspect but concepts of drug delivery are used in tissue engineering with respect to delivery of biomolecules so different biomolecules uh, which have uh, different specific applications like growth factors and uh, other proteins can be loaded to these hydrogels so that it can be released uh, to pr provide desired signals while the hydrogel is being prepared so uh, the rate at which it is delivered can or uh, when it gets delivered or the environment in which it gets delivered can all be controlled when you use the uh, you design the hydrogel appropriately cell encapsulation is something which i uh, talked about where you can actually uh, suspend the cells and you can actually encapsulate the cells so the advantage here is it will provide immuno isolation uh, while diffusion can still happen so uh, one application where this is used this would be useful is artificial pancreas people have tried simple micro encapsulation using calcium alginate beads where they have just suspended islets in calcium alginate beads and uh, shown that it can be reasonably effective however it's still not uh, completely successful that's one of the things which people are working on these are a bunch of other biomedical applications in which hydrogels are used so disposable diapers uh, where they uh, capture the urine so is one of the common thing so you would see a used diaper is uh, quite thick compared to the original diaper that's because it uh, it can actually hold a lot of the water uh, contact lenses uh, are made of hydrogels and uh, medical electrodes uh, you have uh, other coatings of uh, for lubricating the surfaces and uh, your breast implants uh, wound healing materials these are all uh, hydrogels and they are also used as reservoirs for topical drug delivery and so on so uh, currently there are some hydrogels which are commercially available for biomedical applications with respect to wound dressing materials there are quite a few which are hydrogels that are commercially available vigilon hydron and gel, gel perm are some of the uh, more popular ones and uh, people have been exploring these hydrogels for many many applications like uh, kidney membranes artificial skin uh, reconstruction of uh, plastic surgery kind of things and even for vo vocal cord replacements and uh, just like how you can have breast implants other uh, implants and injections these are all different types of hydrogels which have been tried out Okay, so even these botox injections all these things are kinds of hydrogels which have been tried out 